Good evening and welcome to the TDM Talk Show. It's been a year since British voters decided to leave the European Union. However, the Brexit process is still shrouded in uncertainty, and more so after this month's general election in the United Kingdom. Brexit is set to take a toll not only on Great Britain's economy, but also on neighboring Ireland. To talk about the impact of Brexit and also about ireland macau relations, we are joined today by Peter Ryan, Council General of the Republic of Ireland in Macau and Hong Kong. Mr. Ryan is in Macau under the European Union Academic Program in Macau. Peter Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Mr. Council General, thanks a lot for... Coming back to the show, uh, now that we are one year into the Brexit referendum, where do we stand now? Where do you, Ireland, stand now? Well, thank you for the opportunity to come back to visit TDM again. Uh, I'm a regular visitor to Macau, as you know. Today I'm here to speak with the Fundação uh, Hui Cunha uh, later on this evening and with the European uh, Union Academic Programme of Macau, which I think, as you know, my view plays such an important role in building EU-Macau uh, relations. We've had an exciting year. It's been an eventful year. Um, <clears throat> last Monday, as you know, um, marked the, the opening of the formal negotiations uh, between Britain and the EU27. Um, we're quite pleased that that process has now started. There's been a certain certainty, a certain uh, 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 starting point, if you like. Uh, we think that the talks, as, as they've initially opened, have been constructive, and we welcome that. Uh, we welcome the fact that the uh, negotiations uh, have been mapped out. There will be four sets of negotiations uh, leading up to the uh, European Council meeting in October. Uh, the areas uh, have been defined, as you know, as citizens' rights, which means the, the, the rights of the uh, European Union citizens in Great Britain and British uh, citizens who are resident in the EU27. Uh, the financial settlement that will be made, and thirdly, the other separation issues, uh, as well as a, 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 special, um, a special heading under Ireland and Northern Ireland relations, reflecting the, uh, the unique position that Ireland is in. Uh, firstly, we have, a, we have a land border, which will become uh, a frontier between Britain and the European Union. And secondly, we have a, a peace process, which uh, we are very heavily committed to, Britain is committed to, and the European Union, in fact, has invested uh, considerable political capital as well as financial uh, um, sums of money into this into the successful peace process that we have there. So we, we're a year further down the line. Uh, Brexit has been triggered. Um, the talks have made a good start. We're pleased with how that is made, uh, and we think that uh, we're we're delighted that Ireland and Northern Ireland, the special status of that, has been recognised by Michel Barnier and by, the, by our European Union uh, 27 uh, colleagues. But at the same time, especially now with the agreement between the Conservative Party and the Democratic Unionist Party uh, to prop up uh, Theresa May's government, uh, there's been some concerns regarding uh, the impact that this might have on the very uh, on Good Friday agreement. I mean, I'm quoting here, let's say even John Major was concerned about that. What's your take on this? I think the good news is that both the Conservative Party and the DUP committed themselves uh, in, the, in the negotiations and in the subsequent announcements. They recommitted themselves to the Good Friday agreement. Mm -hmm. So that's a really strong starting point. Secondly, the talks in Northern Ireland to re-establish the devolved government are continuing at the moment. Uh, our, our, our Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade and different members of the Irish government have been involved in that. Uh, James Brokenshire and other on the British side have been involved in that. The deadline is Thursday. Um, we hope that there will be a solution uh, and uh, the impasse will be, will be uh, surmounted by the parties. Uh, we believe that a devolved government is necessary. Uh, for Northern Ireland. We think it's particularly important in the context of Brexit mm -hmm. that Northern Ireland has a strong, devolved, active government. Uh, we also think that it is helpful that the, the, the DUP, as you know, uh, will bring a particularly strong focus on Northern Ireland and uh, this recognition that we do not want uh, an economic border on the island of Ireland. They will bring that uh, to the very highest levels of the British government. And I think the British government already has a very high level of awareness of that also. 
But the whole situation has become increasingly polarized and the fact that we've been, the situation and the process has been dragging on for months. I'm talking about the absence of a devolved government and having a, a sort of direct rule by, by London. Now, uh, against the backdrop of an increasingly polarized situation, mm. political situation, which was mirrored, let's say, for instance, even in this month's general election, um, how do you think things can be uh, turned around? I mean, turning the tables and bringing both sides together, uh, sitting on the same, because some of the grandees of the past are not there anymore, um, not only Reverend Presley, but also Martin McGuinness, for instance. Mm. I think there's been a generational change. If you like, we have, we have new, there are new leaders across uh, the various parties that are taking place. I think the, the agreement that was reached uh, the progress that's been made in Northern Ireland. Uh, we've come too far to turn back. Uh, I think there's recognition amongst the general public uh, of that. Certainly there will always be issues that are going to divide the parties. That is the nature uh, of uh, a post-conflict uh, post situation where we're in a conflict and a, a building a reconciliation process. But when we think of the progress that's been made, Ireland is a different place to the Ireland that I grew up in. The fact that we have an all-island economy, the fact that we have uh, a thriving economy, uh, in fact, and we've made so much progress on so many issues that many people told us were intractable. And the European Union, you know, uh, since 1973 has committed more than 2.25 uh, billion euro into reconciliation and peace building programmes in Northern Ireland. And this is a real success story of the European Union, the peace in Ireland and the removal of the gun from Irish politics. If we were sitting here five or ten years ago, uh, or even longer, uh, we, there would be concern that there would be an outbreak of violence again. If you notice now in the commentary, there's no mention, no reference whatsoever to that. The importance now is that we show and we demonstrate that once the parties can get the devolved administration working again, we can show real benefit because there are economic challenges and Brexit will bring increased economic challenges uh, for the Northern Ireland economy and indeed for the border economy in, in, in the rest of Ireland also. Um, talking about the island um, yeah. and the issue of uh, like the importance of avoiding a hard border, avoiding an economic border, because there will be a new border, but uh, how to uh, handle this conundrum? I mean, there will be a border, but at the same time, there will be no hard border. But uh, if the United Kingdom is to leave the customs union, even perhaps the single market, how to address this issue? I think the good starting point is that Irish government, the British government, and the European Union member states, and indeed, all of the 27 member states have now agreed to say Ireland and this unique situation of a border between Ireland and Northern Ireland and the frontier, if you like, between the EU and not EU and a former member of the EU, that this is, a, this is a, an issue that needs to be addressed up front. Um, mm -hmm. We think that there are, there are innovative solutions there. We have shown a lot of innovation. If you think about the introduction of the devolved government, if you think about the measures under the Good Friday Agreement, we've had a succession of innovative but also pragmatic measures, I think, which have helped us to move things forward. So, for example, there's issues around citizenship in Northern Ireland. By virtue of being born in Northern Ireland, you can choose either British or Irish citizenship. This was introduced specifically to reflect the fact of a contested identity and contested space. So we didn't want, to, we wanted to remove identity as a barrier to uh, people living together and uh, thriving in a society. So I've no doubt that Europe, uh, with the negotiators and with the uh, very active participation, obviously, of the Irish and British, and with the uh, Northern Ireland devolved administration, who are going to be fighting and making the case for uh, Northern Ireland to make sure that we don't have, uh, we don't have a, a border, an economic border on the island of Ireland. And when we look at the integration that there is between the economies, and we look at how strong the growth is in certain sectors, for example, in the dairy sector or in the food sector in Ireland, we see it, it simply doesn't make sense to have an economic border. And that certainly is the position of the EU27 at the negotiations at the very outset. Uh, a year ago, I had the chance and the opportunity of uh, visiting Ireland just a few days before 
the Brexit referendum. And I remember quite well, well, there was the talk of the town, a lot of anxiety. Uh, I could sense from all pretty much uh, corners, uh, anxiety and uh, people were very, very worried that, well, they were confident that at the end of the day, British voters would decide to remain, mm -hmm. but they saw it coming in a way. And my question is, um, are people less anxious, less concerned now? I mean, some of the um, uh, worries uh, about the, uh, there was uh, a lot of talk about the impact on the economy and mm. on the peace process. Mm. Uh, how's everything now with regards to the mood? I think the mood, uh, the mood in Ireland towards the European Union itself remains very, very strong. It's upwards of 80%, probably one of the strongest, most pro-European populations within the European Union member states. So that's very interesting. So there hasn't been an overflow, although we have, uh, you know, we share largely a media, a media sector, as you know, that we watch British television, we read British newspapers, we follow British soccer teams. None of the issues... No spillover effect. There wasn't a spillover effect to Ireland. In fact, the opposite was the case, particularly amongst young people. So the pro-European feeling amongst young people, and you know 50% of our population yes. is <laughs> aged under the yes, age of 40, exactly. so it makes me feel old when I go home. So uh, that's, we have a, uh, a pro-European uh, level there of more than 90%. So our, our, our view, the Irish people's view is very straightforward on it. We didn't want Britain to leave the European Union. We don't want Britain to leave the single market. And we don't want them to leave the customs union. Our government actively campaigned for Britain to stay within the European Union. Now that the British people have decided that this is the position that they're going to take, we are going to make sure that our relationship with Britain remains as strong as it has been for the last 20 plus years. We're going to make sure that within the European Union uh, Brexit negotiations, that the interests of our, our economic interests are protected, but most of all, that the peace process on our island is protected. And we're doing that in an unusual position now, because now that Britain is leaving, this will be the first time that Ireland will be a member of the European Union without its closest neighbour also being a member, because we joined together and now Britain is going to leave and we're going to remain. So I think, of course, people are a little bit nervous. Of course they are. We're all a little bit nervous about the unknown. But I think what the government has been doing in Ireland is absolutely demonstrating a relentless, a relentless effort to make sure that our business sector, our social sectors, and all of our society understands and has an opportunity to input to our uh, positions on these. We've had an all-island civic dialogue bringing together people from right across society, so not just politicians, mm -hmm. but civic leaders, uh, youth leaders, uh, people in the NGO sector, uh, think tanks and so on, bringing them together to say, okay, so what is it that Ireland needs to be doing at this particular time? And I think the government has shown great leadership in that. It's very, been very innovative in its approach. And I think we're seeing with the, with the growth in the Irish economy, uh, and the investment that continues to come. And uh, you've seen in investment announcements uh, by some of the largest financial companies in the world who are moving some of their operations to Ireland. This just continues what's been the trend for the past five years, more than five years in Ireland. So I think people's confidence is, is there. We're a little bit uncertain, um, but we want to make sure that we get the best deal for the European Union and also for our British neighbours. And the best deal would yep. be a soft Brexit instead of a hard Brexit. Would I be right in saying that? I think it depends on how you uh, it depends on how you define these things. Yeah. I think our our most the most important the most important issue for us is that uh, this is handled uh, in a negotiated way. We do not want to see a failure of negotiations. We believe that one of the great success stories of the European Union since uh, its establishment has been that the European Union has always found a way, the member states have always found a way to come together and work together. But often the 11th hour is agreement in... Often the 11th hour. Well, that's what the bureaucrats yes. uh, are paid for, if you like. But I think one of the important things for us is to make sure during these negotiations that we don't lose sight of the important challenges that Europe faces. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't subscribe those who say no deal is better than a bad deal? No, I wouldn't. I, would believe, I, I absolutely believe in the power of the EU27 and Britain to come together to negotiate a deal that's of, that is the best deal 
for both sides and to find a way to continue to work together. Because Britain is going to continue to be Ireland's largest neighbour. It's going to continue to play an important role in Europe it just will not be at the table of the European Union at the moment. But we need to make sure that the relationship with Britain, between Britain and, and the European Union and Britain and member states like Ireland continues to be uh, positive for both sides. Europe has huge challenges. When we think about migration, we think about the, 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 the terrorist issue as well as Brexit. And we need to make sure that we continue to address the other issues and demonstrate to our public um, the benefits of being uh, members of the European Union. What about the place of Ireland in post-Brexit European Union? I mean, do you foresee a, a more relevant, assertive role for the Republic of Ireland? It's a good question. I haven't, I, I haven't really considered that. Um, I haven't seen too many commentators talking about that. One of the issues that I have heard from uh, one, one uh, noted economist in Ireland has been that given the Brit Britain's leadership, particularly in the area of financial services in particular, that, uh, and given that Ireland is, uh, you know, is the fourth largest, uh, Dublin is the fourth largest economic hub in Europe, that it will be an increased emphasis on Ireland going forward. But I don't see particularly, I think Ireland plays a really active role as you know, at the European Union level as it is. We are, we, are, we are very active at the United Nations level, we're very active at the European Union level. We don't necessarily see that somehow this is going to transform our role in it. Of course, uh, there, may be certain, um, there may be certain changes in perspective, there may be increased focus on Ireland as a, as a you know, the, the remaining uh, native English language uh, member of the European mm -hmm. Union. But the bonds that we have with the other member states is strong. And I'll just give you a very simple example of that. Under the Erasmus programme, under which, uh, for mobility for third level students to Europe, more than 50,000 young Irish people have travelled to work and study in European universities. More than 50,000. Since Ireland joined the European Union, more than 40 billion euros has been provided to Irish industry, Irish agriculture, Irish society. Irish society has transformed in the time we joined the European Union. It will continue to transform. This is our job, is to make sure that we continue to be flexible and adaptable. When we joined the European Union, when I was a, a small boy, I can't remember it, I'm sorry to say, but I joined, Ireland joined in 1973 when I was very young. Since then, our trade, our overall trade has increased almost 100 times. So we are a different place. And I think this is one of the features of Irish society. We mentioned earlier on that our, our new Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, is uh, in, his, in his late 1930s, uh, in his late 30s, I should say. He's 39. Uh, he's 39. Uh, he's from uh, an Asian uh, background. His dad is from India. Uh, he also is very publicly, uh, has come out as a gay man in public life. And uh, so, uh, you know, Ireland does change, reflects change. And I think it's one of the reasons why we continue to uh, have as bright a future as we do, because we continue to be adaptable and flexible and we're open to outside influence around the world. Open, an open economy uh, and an economy which has been attracting foreign direct investments and also, of course, investing abroad. And I want now to look at the relations, of course, with China and the issue of attracting, and you've been playing a role here as well, uh, in, in the bringing and attracting uh, Chinese investment into the Republic of Ireland. Uh, uh, what's the next step in this respect and how is this intertwined with the uh, One Belt, One Road uh, process uh, uh, and uh, all these uh, bold steps which have been taken by, by China recently? Absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity on that. I think um, Ireland has a very successful track record, as you know, in uh, attracting global investment. So it's not just from China, it's not just from the US, it's from Europe, it's from, in fact, all over the world. At the same time, Irish companies are increasingly looking to go uh, global. Um, last year, in fact, Ireland was the, uh, was the number one destination uh, for Chinese investment into Europe. That was driven by one, by one major deal, which was an aircraft leasing company. Um, um, uh, and that was acquired by a Chinese company. There are certain sectors in which we're very, very strong. So financial services will be one. You know, one of every two aeroplanes in the world is leased from Ireland. 
I know it's an area that Macau is very interested in looking at aircraft leasing. Hong Kong is interested, Singapore is interested. Ten out of the top ten aircraft leasing companies in the world are based in Ireland. So it's something that, we're, that we're, we, we have a reasonable track record in. We have a good track record, I think, in technology space. We have a very good track record in pharmaceuticals and in biomedical devices. We have a very good track record, obviously, in agri-food. In agri-food, which is, will, be, will be our largest indigenous industry, Irish-owned industry, we have a lot of investment coming out, out of Ireland to the rest of the world. Um, we produce about 20% of the milk powder in the world is produced in Ireland. When you think we have 1% of the population of the European Union, 6 million people, 1% of the population of the European Union, and we produce enough food for about 50 million people. And that's largely an Irish-owned, indigenous industry. And part of the Brexit effort and preparation effort that the government has been doing is helping all of these guys to be more international, look for more diversification of markets, look for more uh, opportunities to be Brexit ready, to be ready for what's coming down the line. And a, an important part of that is when we meet with Chinese companies and overseas investors, we say to them, you want to continue to access the European market. It's a market of 500 plus million people post-Brexit. If you want access to it, the tried and trusted way to get that access in an English language environment, in a place that has a very, very competitive uh, labour market, very competitive um, uh, tax, uh, taxation system, but also has an ecosystem. And uh, it's, 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 it's testament to the fact that we have about 1,500 1, overseas companies invested in Ireland, uh, continuing to do so. We're confident that this also helps Irish companies, indigenous domestic Irish companies, to also look and to go, go global. So part of my job is to help them, help the companies uh, find markets here, find customers here. And this is why we're so excited about the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, two weeks ago, we had the uh, party secretary, uh, Hu, of Guangdong province came to Ireland. Ho Chun Hua. Uh, exactly, with 250 uh, companies. And our uh, prime minister, our Taoiseach, and our minister of foreign affairs and trade uh, committed Ireland to, to engaging with the uh, One Belt, One Road uh, project. We're a member of the Asia Infrastructural Investment Bank. Uh, we're very active, uh, also the European Investment Bank, as you would expect. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that there are oppor <coughs> opportunities <coughs> for Irish companies to engage in that. We do a lot of, we, do a, we have a huge experience of trading globally. We have to because we're, a small, we're such a small, mm -hmm. small country. And business ties go hand in hand with uh, people to people linkages. And this has been uh, on your agenda as well. Uh, let's say, for instance, you were talking about Erasmus program, and there are some steps which have been taken in order to bring the peoples of Ireland, Macau, and Hong Kong uh, closer. And I think you have been focusing on this. How has this been translated in recent steps, and what is in the pipeline? Um, I think I have a, per I have a personal uh, passion for academic and people to people links because I believe that universities should be, and uh, the academic world uh, should be uh, global in its mindset. And I think there's a readiness there always to, to experience new, uh, new things, to hear contrary arguments, to encourage debate, and to encourage the flow of ideas uh, globally. Ireland has always looked, of course, to Britain, to Europe, and to mm -hmm. the United States. I think in the recent decades, we've started to look more, more actively at Asia, and we've done so slowly and we've done so carefully, but we've done so, um, uh, we've done so in a way that's really enriched our campuses. Uh, it's really enriched our intellectual, uh, our intellectual um, thinking. It's really enriched our think tanks, for example, our foundations, our counterparts to the organizations and universities here. And my example is very simple that I always give. It's a very personal one. When I attended Ireland's largest university, University College Dublin, uh, the home of James Joyce and many other Nobel Prize winners and everybody else, there were, there were no people from outside Ireland in my undergraduate class and one person from outside Ireland in my master's programme. And that person was an Irish American from the US. <laughs> now my daughter is studying there. She has people from all across the world in her class, 14, 15 different nationalities. How enriching an environment is that for my daughter? So in a very selfish way, for the generations that come after us, 
of course, if we're going to do business and we're going to build cultural links, we're going to do all these things, we have to get people engaged with one another. And I'm really delighted with the openness that there is in Macau to this. And Macau is in such a natural place to do this because of your history, because of the level of awareness, particularly amongst young people, to say that this is a heritage that young Macau people should be really proud of and they should use it as their calling card around the world. And this is something that Irish people do with our links, with our global links also. Uh, we are very fortunate here. We have a unique situation that we have through our missionaries. We have some links with local schools in Macau. Uh, we've appointed, in the, in, uh, just in the last academic year, we appointed 20 young Macanese students as uh, Irish ambassadors, mm -hmm. Ireland ambassadors for the year. So part of that has been us learning from them what their impressions of Ireland are, what their impressions of the European Union are, and so on. And also us sharing with them some insights on uh, studying in Ireland, living in Ireland. Our, you know we have a unique culture. We have our own dance, we have our own language, we have our own, uh, our own sports that are unique uh, to Ireland also. We're very proud of them. Uh, and we like that. We like the fact that we can share them with the world, and also to bring something back to learn a little bit more about Macau back in Ireland. Also, that's part be part of my role. Uh, now, uh, over the last couple of years, we've had for the very first time St. Patrick's Day parades here in Macau, and the Irish Cultural Festival taking place in March. Um, any any outcome of that? Um, endeavor and uh, all those uh, interactions uh, and with regards to cultural events, uh, arts, anything uh, uh, in the charts? Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, you've been a great supporter of this and uh, I think that's one of, the, w w one of the features, one of the really defining features of Macau, the openness to, uh, to explore a new culture and the readiness to do that. And we've done that, as you know, in a very small way, in, a, in our own small way, in our own style. This year we had craftsmen from Ireland uh, and we had animators from Ireland, we had musicians from Ireland. Just two weeks ago we had uh, one of our most famous uh, professors of music here on a short visit. Uh, we've welcomed a whole range of really interesting people to Macau. In, since we opened the consulate we've had five government ministers visit Macau, including the Lord Mayor of Dublin and just last month we had a visit from uh, the Anglican Archbishop of Armagh who is a successor to St. Patrick. So when I introduced him to some of the young people here, I said to them that he was, he, he's in a direct line mm -hmm. of succession from St. Patrick. This is the tradition. And uh, he doesn't dress like St. Patrick. He's much mm -hmm. more modern. Um, but I think one of the interesting things for me was to try to uh, show people here that there are many dimensions to Ireland, that we are a very open and in welcoming culture ourselves. And, so many things in Ireland have been impacted by visitors and emigrants to Ireland over the years. And we, we are very lucky that we have a small uh, community in Macau, but a very dynamic community. We have less than 100 people here. They include quite a few Macanese families who've lived and worked in Ireland. So they're very special to us as well. And it's nice for them to see a little bit of Ireland back here. One of the, one of the big follow-ups for us has been that uh, we have a number of exchanges taking place now. Uh, with various organisations and individuals in Macau. We would like to see more of that. We'd like to encourage more of that. We're going to make it, uh, uh, we're going to make it as, as uh, attractive as possible to come and visit Ireland. We have a lot to offer. We have a very strong cultural heritage in Ireland as well. So tourism, cultural tourism uh, would be definitely uh, it, it's something a very to natural, explore, It's right? a very natural place to meet each other. Mm -hmm. Heritage, building preservation, the building of uh, the building of uh, uh, cultural endeavours to, to support local cultural uh, practitioners. We have a very strong literary tradition in Ireland, as you know, that's very precious to us. Also, we have some unique features to that, and I think we have we have really enjoyed our collaboration uh, with the literary festival in Macau, which is really important and uh, with people like Creative Macau, with the European Union Academic Programme, with the foundation I'm going to speak at later. We have so many partners, we've built so many partners across Macau, there's, there's, there isn't enough hours in the day for me to, uh, to, to keep in contact with them all, but we do our best. And uh, I think all of that has been helped by the fact that we have such a strong economic and business relationship with Hong Kong, with Macau and with China. So I'll leave, you, I'll leave you with a statistic which uh, might surprise you given Ireland's size. But 
trade between Ireland and China has been growing fast, between, between Ireland and China has been growing faster than trade with any European Union member state with China. So we think that we have a lot of things that China, uh, we, we, especially on the One Belt, One Road program. You can see a great deal of complementarity in terms of business ties, right? Well, exactly. So things like food, food and drink products, things like technology, things like tourism, things like financial center services, things like education, things like tourism. These are very natural things for us to partner with in China. And we are, we are the fastest growing uh, economy in the European Union this year as we were 2016 and 2015. So we're very positive about the future of Europe. We're positive about our own future. We're going to be absolutely relentless in working hard to make sure that we achieve that. We're not, gonna, we're not going to stand around or sit around congratulating ourselves. There's a lot of work to do and I think... Not resting on learn. your laurels, right? Exactly, and I think there's a lot we can learn from Macau. And I, I, I really do believe that and I believe that as Macau is, is, is going to be interacting with the Lusophone countries, it's an obvious partner for us uh, to assist and to help on things like everything from technology to scientific research. There's a whole list of things that we are enthusiastic to work with Macau on. And with this note, we wrap up our talk. Council General Peter Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. Fascinating talk and pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you thank very you. much. And to you at home, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week.